we interrupt this program to bring you the governor's State of the State Address. This Joint Assembly of the Mississippi Legislature is now in session. Please let the Joint Assembly come to order. This time I'd like to recognize the House Clerk to uh, introduce the Escort Committee. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Lieutenant Governor Reeves and Speaker Gunn announce a committee composed of Senators Gandy, Sojourner, and Kirby, along with Representatives Deborah Dixon, Espy, and Weathersby to escort the First Lady to the dais. Lieutenant Governor Reeves and Speaker Gunn announce a committee composed of Senators Harkins, Sampson Jackson, and Parks, along with Representatives Powell, Flags, and Curry to escort Governor Phil Bryant to the dais. Would the escort committees please go to the rules room and retrieve the governor and the first lady. Sergeant Arms, you're recognized. It is my pleasure at this time to introduce the Lieutenant Governor of the state and my counterpart and a close friend and one I enjoy working with very closely, Lieutenant Governor Tate Reeves. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Let me begin by introducing the House Speaker Pro Tem, Greg Snowden. I know my colleagues in the Senate enjoy working with Mr. Snowden, with the Speaker, and with the Governor. At this time, I'd like to recognize the President Pro Tem of the Mississippi Senate, Senator Terry Brown. Now, let's welcome our statewide elected officials. Please hold your applause until all have been introduced. Secretary of State Delbert Hoseman. State Treasurer Lynn Fitch. State Auditor Stacy Pickering. And Commissioner of Agriculture and Commerce Cindy Hyde-Smith. It's okay to applause now. We thank them for their great service to the citizens of our state. Now, please help me welcome the members of the Mississippi Supreme Court. Again, please hold your applause until all have been introduced. First, Chief Justice Bill Waller, Jr. Presiding Justice Jess Dickinson. Presiding Justice Michael Randolph. Justice Ann Lamar. Justice James Kitchens. Justice David Chandler, Justice Randy Pierce, 
and our newest Justice Josiah Coleman. Thank you all for your service. Now, help me welcome our State Court of Appeals. Chief Judge Joseph Lee, Presiding Judge Tyree Irving, Presiding Judge Kenneth Griffiths, Judge Donna Barnes, Judge David Ishi, Judge Larry Roberts, Judge Virginia Carlton, Judge James Maxwell II, Judge Eugene Fair Jr., and Judge Ciola James. Thank you. Now let's welcome our public service commissioners of the Northern District, Brandon Presley, of the Central District, Lynn Posey, and of the Southern District, Leonard Bentz. Thank you. And now help me welcome our Transportation Commissioners of the Northern District, Mike Taggart, of the Central District, Dick Hall, and of the Southern District, Commissioner Tom King. At this point, it is my distinct honor and privilege to introduce the First Lady of Mississippi, Deborah Bryant. And now, please join me in welcoming the Governor of the State of Mississippi, the Honorable Phil Bryant. my heart. Thank you so much. Thank you, Mr. Lieutenant Governor and Speaker. Now, I am honored to be here tonight before you and to be with these two young, dynamic leaders that will help me move this state forward. Thank you, Mr. Speaker, and thank you, Mr. Lieutenant Governor, for what you do. Now, I know as we begin this new year, both of these leaders stand ready to bring positive change to Mississippi. Now, Mr. Speaker, I will tell you there was some debate in my office as to whether or not we should refer to you as being young. I used my executive privilege to say that was staying in my speech. <laughs> to the members of the legislature, I want to thank you in advance for your service. Now, I know that all of you will join me in thanking the people of Mississippi who sent us here to represent them. In this grand republic, the citizens are the servants, the sovereigns, while we are the servants. We are here to work on behalf of our fellow Mississippians and to support productive policies that will bring positive change to our state. And I believe we are ready for the task. Now, I hope we have another great session all the way until we hear one of your favorite Latin terms, sine die. Yeah. Now, when I was here, one of our favorite Latin terms was per diem. 
I am proud that Mississippi's First Lady is here with us tonight. Deborah has traveled across this state this past year showing support and raising awareness for various calls and inspiring those Mississippians who have been affected by disaster. And I have been honored to watch her rise to her new role with the grace and caring that has blessed our home for 36 years. She is the light of my world and an inspiration to those she reaches. And please, if you would again, join me in thanking our First Lady. Thank you, David. I remember we were in Smithville, Mississippi, and she was working so hard. Uh, the mayor came up to me and said, now, I don't know if you're going to run for governor again, and I don't know if you'll carry Smithville, but she will. <laughs> in 1624, the English poet John Donne wrote, no man is an island entire of itself reminding us that the power we hold as a collective group is greater than the power of any single individual. The people of Mississippi made a change in leadership at the Capitol a year ago, and what they expect is bold action. Now, each of us is a part of this great state, and each of us has a responsibility to contribute. Tonight, let us first remember that any success we may achieve through this body must be completed together. As I told you last year, we may fail separately, but surely we will rise together. Now, the Constitution requires me from time to time to report to you the state of our state. Last year was a great year for Mississippi. New jobs were created, tax relief was given, Workforce training plans were enacted and advances in our energy and health care took hold. Across Mississippi, dual enrollment programs were taking shape to provide more opportunity to help lower the dropout rate. More children are being treated for dyslexia due to the laws passed last session. And thanks to the work of this legislature, the Department of Education changed the complicated formula for ranking our schools to a simple one. A through F. And the passage of the Child Protection Act has given law enforcement officials more tools to bring child predators to justice. In 2012, you helped produce one of the most business-friendly legislative sessions in modern history, and I want to thank you. Therefore, I am proud to stand here, able to report that the state of our state is strong. Now, I would be remiss in not recognizing those that have supported me. My children, Katie and Patrick and son-in-law Stephen, are here with us. It's good to see y'all. Thank you so much for what you do for your old dad. Now, last January, I told you my first job was to make sure every Mississippian who wants a job has one. Now, we have made great improvements. And with the help of the Mississippi Development Authority, we grew our existing businesses and brought new world-class companies to our state. And as governor, I am so proud of our state when a new business opens its doors or an existing business announces an expansion. Those are moments that are a testament to our people and a commitment to job creation. Last year, Mississippi's economic development efforts resulted in the announcement of nearly two, I'm sorry, two 2,700 new jobs. 22,700. I'm going to get this right in a minute. 2,700 new jobs. 2,700. The, this success represents a private sector investment of more than half a billion dollars. Now, let me share a few examples. Rolls Royce announced a $50 million investment to construct a second jet engine test stand at Stennis Space Center. They created 35 new jobs, high tech jobs. 
Rolls-Royce and Stennis Space Center are an integral part of Mississippi's aerospace industry. And Stennis continues to develop research and technology to further the exploration of space. Now remember, it has been said, man may one day go to Mars, but he will have to pass through Hancock County to get there. Kimberly Clark is increasing its presence in Mississippi, opening a medical products distribution facility in South Haven that is creating 100 new jobs. More than a quarter of the world's population uses this global company's products every day. Caterpillar is working to build a new warehouse facility in all Corn County. Now, this project represents a private sector investment of more than $30 million, and Caterpillar will create 35 additional jobs in that new facility. Medso, a Finland-based process technology company that employs more than 30,000 people worldwide, announced plans to further invest in its Clarksdale operations. This company is adding approximately 40 jobs and investing $4 million in its Mississippi expansion. Uh, Nissan. Nissan in 2012 increased in production and added the central line and 1,000 new jobs to its Canton facility. <laughs> just two weeks ago, just two weeks ago, Nissan celebrated 10 years of manufacturing e excellence in Mississippi and announced it would build yet another model in this state, the Murano crossover. There are also companies creating jobs in Mississippi whose names may not be recognizable but are just as important in our economic efforts. These businesses are global leaders in their industries. For example, Borg Warner, a leading powertrain technology manufacturer, announced an expansion in Water Valley, Water Valley, and the creation of 50 new jobs. This is Borg Warner's third expansion in Mississippi in two years. Roxel, a leading manufacturer of stone wool insulation products, is investing $130 million to build its first U.S. manufacturing plant, which will create 150 jobs in Marshall County. Foley Products, a manufacturer of precast concrete components, announced a new facility and an investment of $7 million in Prentiss. The new facility will create 40 jobs. General Atomics is investing $12 million in its seventh expansion in Tupelo, which is creating 25 new jobs. Just two weeks ago, components manufacturer Aurora Flight Sciences announced a $17 million expansion, creating 250 new jobs in Columbus. Drax Biomass announced it would construct a new wood pellet production facility in Gloucester, Mississippi. Gloucester, Mississippi. Its Mississippi-made pellets will fuel the company's power plants in the UK. The project will create 45 jobs in Amit County and represent an investment of more than $80 million by the company. One week ago, we cut the ribbon on Comfort Revolution's new furniture manufacturing facility in Tishomingo County. The company is creating 200 new jobs. Now, while I've named only a few of some of the larger projects of some here in Mississippi, efforts by MDA to help expand our existing homegrown businesses go on every day. Now, contract fabricators, a manufacturer of large pressure vessel head, headquartered in Holly Springs, Mississippi, headquartered in Holly Springs, is investing just over a million dollars to expand into Iuka and create 50 new jobs there. Two businesses, Mount Olive-based Blaine and Forez Canada, announced a new partnership to manufacture sand used in oil and gas recovery. Blaine invested $7 million, and his Canadian partner invested $27 million in its new Mississippi operations. Together, these companies created 60 new energy-related jobs. Oxford-based mortgage technology company FNC announced an expansion into international markets, which is creating 100 new jobs. 
The company was recently named, this is a Mississippi company, that was recently named one of the top 100 financial tech companies in the world. And VT Halter, VT Halter Marine, headquartered in Pascagoula, Mississippi, is constructing a ship repair facility that will generate 400 new jobs. The, current, the company currently employs 2,000 people at the Mississippi shipyard. And I am pleased tonight to make a new economic development announcement, an announcement here tonight. Ashley Furniture, one of the largest furniture manufacturing companies in the world and a leading employer in our state, is expanding its Mississippi operations. Ashley, Ashley Furniture has had a manufacturing presence in Mississippi since 1994, and this world-class company has continued to invest in its Mississippi operations and in our people over the years. Today, the company operates manufacturing facilities in Ecru and Ripley that employ more than 3,000 people. With, with this expansion, with this expansion, Ashley will soon be opening a mattress manufacturing, manufacturing and custom service center in Verona, which will create another 60 jobs. Now, joining us tonight is Mr. Ron Wannick, chairman and co-owner of Ashley Furniture. Ron, thank you. Thank you for your belief in Mississippi. Ron Warnick, ladies and gentlemen. <laughs> Ron, you got a bigger round of applause than I did. <laughs> we look forward to many years of success for Ashley Furniture in the state of Mississippi. Now, I describe all of these projects to you so that you can see at once what I see every day as governor. MDA making contact with site selectors, beginning the competitive recruitment process, putting a deal together, and landing a business win. With all the work our sister states have recently put into economic development, we must support the critical role of MDA. Now, please. Please. Tonight, I call on you to make sure the world knows Mississippi will not take a back seat to anyone when it comes to attracting jobs. In the fall of this year, Mississippi will be the host of the United States Southeastern Association and Japan Association meeting on our Gulf Coast. Our partnership with Japanese companies that do business in our state, like Toyota and Nissan, is strong. Hosting what we call Zeus Japan is our opportunity to showcase that partnership for the companies in attendance. Now, I'm honored to have here with us tonight our American Chairman of Zeus Japan, Mr. William Yates, President and CEO of W.G. Yates & Sons Construction Company based in Philadelphia, Mississippi. Join me in welcoming William Yates. Thank you, William. Through business development efforts, I get a chance to meet and talk with business leaders from around the world. They continually express their admiration for the quality of our people and our workforce. Now, this session, there is one definitive way we can make sure that our workforce will remain competitive. We must improve our public education system. After the legislative session last year, I formed a working group of educators at all levels to identify the core problems in Mississippi's public education system and develop realistic recommendations for improvement. The statistics are troubling. 
Statewide figures show that nearly 17% of Mississippi students begin, that begin high school never graduate. Worse, 22 school districts in this state have a dropout rate of 25% or more. One half of Mississippi third graders are not proficient at reading. Let me repeat that. One half of Mississippi's third graders currently are not proficient at reading. More than two-thirds of our fourth graders and eighth graders are also behind in reading, and Mississippi's math attainments are equally dismal. Now, these facts just can't be ignored or explained away by concluding we just aren't spending enough money on public education. Make no mistake, these alarming numbers are evidence of a crisis in our educational system, and we are tied directly and are tied directly to our dropout rate, our poverty rate, and more. Our very economic stability as a state is threatened if our education system is not improved. Our higher education system spent more than $35 million last year on, on remediation, and only 11% of Mississippi students who took the ACT met all its benchmarks for college readiness. We must make reforms now so that our citizens can be productive contributors to our communities and less relying on social welfare programs. <laughs> My administration has issued a set of policies to improve our schools known as Education Works, these measures address our most pressing needs. One of the policies many of you have heard me speak about is what I call the third grade gate. Now, that simply means we will end social promotion of third grade students who cannot read at a third grade level. We only we only hurt our students when we shuffle them through the system before they are ready. And taking additional time to ensure these students have adequate literacy skills will prepare them for success in later grades. I call on you to enact this important reform this year. I was also I would also ask you to fund $15 million to assist with literacy improvement efforts. Now, these funds will help us train teachers better on best practices in reading instructions. We'll also help provide reading interventionists to help struggling third graders and other students. Our education system does a better job early on making sure that students can read on a grade level, when we do that, when we make sure those students can read early on on their grade level, then we know remediation costs will decline. I've also discussed pay for performance or merit pay for our teachers. Now, I believe we should reward our best, most effective teachers by compensation. Let me be clear. Thank you. Now let me be very clear, no teacher will lose any salary. Four districts, Lamar, Gulfport, Rankin, and Clarksdale, have agreed to pilot this program. And the results will, be will help implement evaluations using frameworks established by the Mississippi Department of Education. Rewarding our best teachers with higher pay is the best way to keep great teachers in the classroom. In addition to keeping and rewarding great classroom teachers, we must raise the bar for new teachers. The bill I submitted raises the entrance standards for education programs. Under this act, a student must have a 21 ACT score and a minimum GPA of 3.0 to become a teacher. Now, why would we want anything less for our students? Now, we can also incentivize the best and brightest students to be school teachers by paying for them to attend in-state colleges. 
Now I'm asking for you to fund 200 scholarships for students who have a 28 ACT score and a 3.5 GPA who commit to teaching in Mississippi's public schools for five years. When it comes to early childhood education, early childhood education, we must be realistic. Now, I believe that parents have a responsibility for their child's earliest learning. But unfortunately, many have abandoned that duty. To address this issue, we should work within the existing framework of the child care centers throughout the state and continue to assist in improving their efforts by working with successful programs like Mississippi's Building Blocks, we can develop best practices in early education. Now, I'm asking you to fund $3 million to continue the literacy research Building Blocks is conducting so that we can help make sure children begin school ready to learn. <laughs> for far too long, for far too long, a family street address locked them behind a wall into one school. Now what if that school were failing? What options do the parents have? As of today, the answer is none. Tonight, I'm calling on you to change that. When districts, listen closely, please, when districts have the room and choose to accept students from other attendance zones, we should allow them to do so. Open enrollment will create competition and offer freedom from restrictions that keep children in failing schools. Mississippi legislators, let us tear down those walls. I'm asking you to pass an act that will create privately funded opportunity scholarships so students who are below 250% of the poverty level and live in D and F school districts can have a chance to take resources and go elsewhere. Tonight, let us commit ourselves to give parents a choice so children can have a chance. We should also have a workable, successful charter school act that provides choices for parents. More than 40 other states have this option. Shouldn't we allow such opportunities for our own children? Now, I applaud the Senate and the House for their efforts on this important issue. And when a good charter school bill reaches my desk, I intend to sign it. Thank you. I am also asking you to support dropout prevention programs like Jobs for Mississippi Graduates, fund national certifications for high school students en enrolled in workforce training and continue to support Teach for America and the Mississippi Teachers Corps. President Ronald Reagan reminded us in his 1982 State of the Union of the countless, quiet, everyday heroes of American life. Counted among those heroes are the parents who worked so hard to bring more opportunity and a better life to their children. It is for these quiet heroes that we strive we must make available the opportunity to succeed. No longer should we tightly grip the key to the gate that traps children in poorly performing schools and districts. That key should be freely offered. And tonight, I urge you to protect Mississippi's economic future by enacting these bold reforms. It is imperative that we remember 
what others have also known. The path to Mississippi's economic success must pass through the schoolhouse door. I am honored. I am honored that both chairmen of the Senate and House Education Committees have agreed to author Education Works Act for 2013, and I thank Senator Gray Tollison and Representative John Moore for their courage and support. Just as failure in public education can threaten our economic stability, so too can overreaching federal mandates. Mississippi is faced with shouldering the cost of the so-called Affordable Care Act, or as some call it, Obamacare. Now, many of these costs will be thrust upon us without our consent. However, the Supreme Court said we do reserve the right to choose whether or not we expand Medicaid. Now, let me be clear. Any law that will add 300,000 Mississippians to a federal entitlement program partially funded by the state will either result in a huge tax increase or drastic cuts in education, public safety, job creation, and other budgets. It will leave our children and grandchildren with a ballooning federal debt. The research company Milliman analyzed the Affordable Care Act and its potential impact on Mississippi. They determined that if Mississippi fully expands Medicaid, our state will spend more than $12 billion on the program between 2014 and 2020. These numbers are staggering. Now, instead of assuming enormous costs that we cannot afford, I would suggest that we spend our time and effort in finding good jobs for all Mississippians. We should be compassionate by lowering Medicaid population through economic growth, personal responsibility, and providing more access to private sector health care. Yeah. Now, to help further development our medical industry and to identify ways to improve our personal health, to do both, I am pleased to announce Tonight, the formation of the Mississippi Healthcare Solutions Institute. Now, Dr. Clay Hayes, a respected cardiologist and former chairman of the Greater Jackson Area Chamber Partnership, will serve as the first chair of this non-government, non-profit group. This institute will serve as a chamber of commerce, if you will, of healthcare bringing our medical industry together and supporting health care as an economic driver in our state. Please join me in thanking Dr. Clay Hayes for assuming this critical responsibility. Thank you, Dr. Hayes. One essential health care step we must take is increasing the number of doctors in Mississippi. Now, we know that physicians create about $2 million in economic impact the minute they enter their communities. This includes the people they hire and the equipment and supplies they buy to run their offices. Having more providers will create better health care access for all Mississippians, thereby lowering the cost of health care. Uh, just this month, I joined the University of Mississippi Medical Center to break ground on a new expansion of the School of Medicine. With the addition of new classrooms and laboratories, each incoming class of medical students will increase to more than 160. This means Mississippi will graduate more doctors. The university estimates about 2025 an expanded medical school will produce 1,000 new physicians and support more than 19,000 new jobs. Now, I, I, I would ask the legislature to consider the impact of this medical school on our state and please support its growth. Now, we should also look to our energy sector for growth and job opportunities. 
Mississippi is a leader in many energy-related policies and industry practices. By supporting energy development and investment, we can bring more jobs to our residents. As chair of the Southern States Energy Board, I will work hard to make sure Mississippi is positioned as a leader in the energy economy of the future. As all of you I know understand, Mississippi's business climate plays a critical role in attracting new opportunities and new jobs to our state. In my executive budget recommendation, I propose a small business tax relief measure that will further stabilize our business climate. Now, each June, certain small employers in the state are required to prepay a portion of their taxes. Now, this is known as the delayed accelerated tax payment, a name only government could create. <laughs> delayed accelerated tax payment. And this move puts a large burden on our state's job creators. My budget proposes a relief for small employers, and I urge the legislature to support it. The National Federation of Independent Businesses joins me in this call, and I hope you will join us. <laughs> Last year, we took steps to protect Mississippi's financial stability. Uh, you were very responsive to my request to spend no more than 98 percent of the general fund revenue. And I made the same request this year and asked you to join me in this commitment to savings, and I know you will. I also ask you to heed the guidance of my executive budget recommendation and support the essential functions of our government. Now, I understand the difficult decisions required when allocating limited resources for multiple priorities. I've submitted two balanced budgets as governor and as lieutenant governor. I served during the beginning of the worst financial crisis in a decade. We had to make tough choices to cut more than $100 million from state government in four years. However, I believe public safety and economic development are important functions of our government. Public safety is essential and they should be treated as such. Now, I will accept that any, agent, any agency can do a better job of managing their resources. Believe me, I continually challenge my executive agency heads to do just that. I especially ask, if you will, that you will work to the best of your ability with my new, our new, our new executive director at MDA, Mr. Brent Christensen, to support economic development, business recruitment, and tourism in Mississippi. Brent, thank you for being here tonight. <laughs> the story of our country is bound by the men and women who risk and in many cases gave their lives for the lives of someone else. Human acts of selflessness are what sustain and define our great nation. As Mississippians, one could say our most active security threat is the strike of severe weather. And last year, like many years prior, reminded us of the sudden danger that severe weather can bring. Mississippi suffered the impact of Hurricane Isaac just a few short months ago. This storm destroyed homes, threatened dams, and flooded communities. Families were rescued from the rising flood waters by swift water boat teams. I'm proud to have personally witnessed the bravery of the individuals from the Mississippi National Guard, the Department of Wildlife, Fisheries and Parks, the Department of Public Safety, and many local response agencies. In all, nearly 900 Mississippians owe their lives to the daring rescues of these brave men and women. Please join me in thanking these Mississippi heroes.
So now we and this government at this place and in this time have begun our second year of service. Now I know each of you understand that nothing which truly makes a difference is ever achieved alone. As your governor, I stand ready to lead our state forward. I've asked you to consider some bold initiatives tonight, and I'm under no illusion that accomplishing them will be easy. But to paraphrase President John F. Kennedy, we do not attempt these things because they are easy, but because they are hard and we are willing to accept the challenge. I know that all of us share good intentions and great hopes for our mutual success. I am reminded of chapter 1, verse 18 in the book of Isaiah where the prophet writes, Come now, let us reason together. Here is my pledge to you. Work in good faith with me on items both easy and hard, and I will pledge to you to do the same. We are a state of great people. We're confident in pursuing a promising future. Remember, no man is an island entire of itself. We must work together to achieve big things, and together we will. God bless each of you. God bless Mississippi, and God bless the United States of America. Thank you. Thank you, Governor Bryant. As this joint assembly comes to a close, I would like to recognize the gentleman from Pearl River, the Honorable Mark Formby, to dissolve the joint session. Uh, Mr. Speaker, I move this joint assembly now be dissolved. Ladies and gentlemen, you have heard the motion from the gentleman from Pearl River that this joint assembly be dissolved. All those in favor say aye. aye. All those opposed say no. The ayes have it. This joint assembly is now dissolved. And now, the Democratic response. Good evening. I'm Brian Clark, Representative, House District 47, representing parts of Atala, Holmes, and Yazoo County. It is an honor tonight to give the Democratic response to Governor Bryan on behalf of my district, my fellow Democratic legislators, and the Mississippi Democratic Party. As a young boy traveling to the Capitol with my father, I learned that the measure of a servant is the difference he or she makes in the lives of others. This year, we lost three members of the legislature who were the embodiment of that servant spirit. Our state will greatly miss the service of Senator Benny Turner, Senator Alice Harden, and Representative David Gibbs. Now, we must honor their legacy by recommitting ourselves to making Mississippi a better place for all of our families. It is a sad truth that at a time when so many of our families are struggling, with serious kitchen table issues such as paying bills, saving for college, and finding work, Mississippi Republicans are fixed on an agenda aimed at deepening the division between us rather than calling us to a common purpose. If Mississippi is to achieve its potential, we must stop playing, stop playing political games and put a proper focus on job creation. Those same Republicans who cast a critical eye on the national debt and the federal unemployment rate during last year's election have forgotten that as Mississippi officials, we must take care of home first. With an 8.6% unemployment rate, excluding those Mississippians who have stopped looking for work, Mississippi's unemployment rate is higher than the national average. Instead of fighting to put Mississippians back to work, we have spent far too much time on partisan political issues that have made it harder on our workers. 
there's a simple reason that Mississippi haven't seen the economic growth under the new Republican leadership. They don't have a jobs plan. We can do better, and the Democrats and the legislature are committed to an agenda that creates jobs by giving small businesses the tools they need to succeed and by putting Mississippians back to work building our state's infrastructure. A successful economic development plan must include utilizing both the appropriation and bonding process to provide funds for roads, for bridges, for our community colleges and universities, for repairs and renovations, and helping our small cities and counties who are feeling the pressure of a slow economy. The truth is, small businesses rely on these programs to keep current employees on the payroll and to grow their business. And the good news is that we can meet all of these goals without raising any taxes. Thanks to years of responsible budgeting, we have more than $198 million that are unaccounted for in Governor Bryant's budget. These dollars represent tax payments from Mississippi families that were sent to Jackson to keep state government running. Instead of putting that money to work, politicians are parking that money in accounts to make themselves look better. This is not being good stewards of our state resources, and we should not ask our workers, our education and health care systems to suffer while we have money in the bank that can help. And at the end of the day, the appropriation process is about values and, and priorities. And as we move through the 2013 session, we have to make sure our resources are being used to create jobs and grow our economy. If we ever hope to get out of Mississippi's double dip recession, we will have to have a renewed focus on our economy. According to one of our state economists, while other states saw economic growth in 2012, Mississippi was one of the only states in the country that actually went backwards and slipped back into a recession. It's not hard to diagnose the problem. During last year's session, you paid 174 legislators to spend countless hours of committed time and floor debate on the personhood issue, an issue that was overwhelmingly rejected by Mississippi voters during the 2011 election. In fact, there was 13 bills filed by members of the legislature that was designed to address personhood. And almost all of those proposals found their way onto a committee agenda. We also wasted time on an immigration bill that didn't even have the support of law enforcement, business leaders, our cities, nor our counties. We cannot afford to waste any more time helping would-be statewide candidates build their political resume. It's time to get real and focus like a laser on our state economy. We've all heard politicians talk about education during the election, and Mississippi is no different. Every candidate for Mississippi legislature promised that, if elected, they would go to Jackson and fix our education system. Unfortunately, our legislative leaders forgot to talk with parents, educators, and taxpayers about their plan. That's why we spent so much time talking about a charter school bill that wasn't vetted by anyone except out-of-state groups that want to profit off the backs of our children. But we can't just say no. That's why the Democratic Party's education plan is to seek out new innovative ways to improve education in underserved parts of the state and strengthen those districts that are getting it right. Mississippi has an opportunity to grow its economy by using the proposed formula change to the Medicaid program. Right now, 25 percent of Mississippians are enrolled on Medicaid. New changes will allow states to increase Medicaid coverage by using an index of 133 percent of the poverty level. That means a Mississippi family of four with a household income of $30,000 will be eligible. By allowing these hardworking families to have access to health care, we can save the state nearly half a billion dollars a year in funds currently being used to pay for uncompensated care. For example, 68 million of your tax dollars went to the University Medical Center to cover uncompensated health costs associated with folk who needed emergency services but didn't have health insurance. By giving some of these Mississippians access to health coverage, thousands of people will no longer have to use our emergency rooms like a doctor's office, and they can instead receive the kind of ongoing care that will help prevent some of the illnesses that currently create a drain on our economy. Medicaid change could also 
help some people come off the overpriced plans that cost Mississippi taxpayers too much. By moving qualified individuals off the state insurance plan onto a Medicaid plan, the state will save more money. Medicaid also offered Mississippi a rare opportunity to fix some recent budgeting errors. See, during the 2012 session, Republicans moved $70 million from the budget in the name of ending the inventory tax, and there was no effort to replace these funds. The Medicaid change could provide $6.4 billion in the first three years that would be put to work improving our health care system and creating jobs. In the fourth year, we could provide our assessment of $160 million and receive an additional $1.6 billion annually to revolutionize Mississippi's health care and put Mississippians to work. This 10 to 1 investment is math that just works for Mississippi by improving health care and growing our economy. It has the added impact of making up for some sloppy budget work done over the last several months. It's not enough to simply say the things that you are for or against. You have to have solutions. That's why the Democrats and the Mississippi legislature have five priorities. Number one, legislation to fund infrastructure like roads, bridges, small cities and counties, and our community colleges and universities. Two, education reform that targets failing school districts. Three, taking advantage of changes to the Medicaid program that will provide health care and create jobs. Four, making sure that we use all available resources to help our state. It simply doesn't make sense to hoard a taxpayer funds while Mississippi children and working families suffer. And when we do use a savings account, it should be put in an account that gives the state a preferred rate. Finally, Mississippi Democrats are proud to stand with our state employees. Those first responders, those classroom teachers, and those public servants who helped make Mississippi great. We remember the promises we made to these employees, and we will not allow those promises to be broken in the name of political expediency. We have an opportunity tonight to bridge the partisan divide and usher in a time of sustainable growth for all Mississippians. We ask Mississippians to join us in this effort. Together, Mississippi can and will do better. Thank you. You've heard the governor's priorities for the 2013 legislature. What are the lawmakers going to do? Watch MPB's new legislative review at issue beginning Thursday, January 31st at 7 p.m. It'll be a live report every Thursday during the legislative session.